For many years, software companies have been breaking up their applications into individual services for the purposes of isolation and maintainability. In the early 2000s, we might have called this pattern service-oriented architecture. Today, we call it microservices. Why did we change that terminology? Did the services get smaller? No, not exactly. Jonas Bonner suggests that the movement towards cloud and the increased prevalence of mobile changes how we look at these services, so much so that we needed to change the terminology necessary to even talk about our services. And once the conversation has shifted to microservices, what steps do we need to take to implement those microservices properly? The Reactive Manifesto is a collection of principles for how to build applications. When the Reactive Manifesto is applied to the idea of microservices, we get reactive microservices, which Jonas and I discuss in today's episode. It's a great episode about microservices, and I hope you enjoy it. When I'm choosing the tools for my side projects, the first thing that I look for is ease of use. That's why I love MongoDB. It is the most popular non-relational database, and it is super easy to use. At the beginning of a project, I often don't know the shape of my objects, and Mongo makes it easy to evolve the database schema as I like over time. Over time, as my project gets popular, I'm going to need to scale, and thankfully, MongoDB has built-in horizontal scalability, but configuration and database maintenance aren't really what I want to spend my time on. Thankfully, MongoDB Atlas was released in 2016. MongoDB Atlas is the easiest way to get access to MongoDB without having to run the database yourself. You pay only for what you use, from small projects all the way up to large production deployments. To try MongoDB Atlas today, go to mongodb.com slash sedaily and get a free $25 in credit. Use promo code GOATLAS25 to get that $25 in free credit. Atlas is the only hosted MongoDB service built by the engineers behind the database, the company MongoDB. With Atlas, you get end-to-end -end encryption, you get VPC peering, you get access to the latest releases, and for a limited time, you can go to mongodb.com slash sedaily Enter promo code GOATLAS25 and get that $25 in credit and get started with MongoDB Atlas. Thanks to MongoDB for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily and thanks for being the database behind a lot of my favorite side projects in the past. We're really happy to have MongoDB as a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Jonas Bonaire is the CTO of Lightbend. So, uh, so the story has been told on many episodes of this show that companies are moving from monolithic architectures to microservices. And we're going to get to a discussion of how that's happening, how companies are doing that. But let's start with the question of why. What are the pressures that are pushing companies to adopt microservices? Yeah, there are, there's probably as, as many de definitions of microservices as there are people, or at least there are teams using it. So, uh, but one de one the definition that that and one sort of driving motivation is that I that that I've used and that I see is as important is that it it really supports you to scale the organization. I mean, scale the development of 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 an application or or a system. I mean. In, in a way that it supports you, you, you to like split up the organization into multiple in, independent teams. Each team is fully autonomous and can sort of roll out features independent of, of, of other teams. So you need to reduce coupling, coupling here. And, and uh, essentially, so you can both de develop, deploy, and also manage your, the services that you as the team develop completely, completely independent of, of, of other teams. So uh, and in this, it's um, I think that's the reason why it's one big reason why microservices has has gotten so much traction lately, especially in larger organizations. I mean, the time to market is more important than ever. Systems are are 
are, are getting more and more complex and, and how do you cope with this complexity, rolling out features quickly, etc. But I also think that, the, that there's another sort of view to microservices that, that, that uh, a lot of people miss, miss out on and that is that it's, <clears throat> it's, it's actually a, a subset, I, I view it as a subset of reactive systems. And reactive systems are designed to, to, to not just you know, tackle the organization the development challenges of today, but actually the architectural and the and the the system design challenges, building systems that are you know ready for the for for the promise of the cloud. I mean elasticity, I mean being really resilient, and 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 making use of of, of both cloud computing in terms of you know multiple machines as well as as all these multi core hardware that we're getting from Intel and AMD. Hmm, absolutely. Uh, every 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 day. So so I see. I mean, I, I see. There's two 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 different perspectives. I mean, uh, and I think both of these uh, views are e- are equally important. So you are talking about these uh, some different pressures, and I think um, this is this is an interesting thing to touch on because it's not like microservices are this complete like we have some sort of breakthrough that has totally changed the paradigm from service oriented architecture it's more that there are all these different things that are going on things like hard, like hardware changes uh, uh increased competition because the cloud has lowered the barrier to entry so everybody has to move faster or else they're just going to get left behind um and then obviously there's the advantages of moving to a more service based with with narrow services domain driven design and so a lot of these things uh, are pushing us towards what we now call microservices but the idea of microservices is you know you could just think of it as the service oriented architecture of the past but in in terms of reactive microservices this is the idea of applying the reactive manifesto to services. Can you talk about what the reactive manifesto is? Yeah, the, the reactive manifesto is essentially a set of, of, of design principles, you can say, that, uh, <clears throat> that is not really new. I mean, it goes back to a lot of wisdom in this from the 70s of 80s, right? I mean, in, in, in particular, a lot of the work from Jim Gray and, and, and Pat Hell and the building truly resilient systems and, 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 and also, you know, Joe Armstrong and Robert Virding on, on Erlang systems, etc. Uh, uh, building the, Ur- Ur- the Erlang platform. And I think, I think these, these guys, they were ahead of their time. I mean, they, they, they really defined what is, what is the, the, the way we need to think about software t- t- today. But today, but I'd say the last ten to fifteen years, so reality has sort of caught up with their somehow original and, and visionary thinking. So so so, reactive systems is is I mean, according to the manifesto. The reason we wrote the manifesto is essentially to try to capture all this wisdom and all the all the great ideas that are needed more now than ever into a a sort of a blueprint for how we need to think about system design. And 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 uh, it's of course. I mean, it's just a one two pager, right? So you, it's it's, it's it just scratches the fur the the surface. But what it mainly tries to do is to is to 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 give us and give uh, the community a, a, a common vocabulary how to talk about these things, because because sort of the needs for these type of systems, the need to tackle you know resilience and elasticity uh, and, and and also I mean concurrency ma- maximizing utilization of, of all the hardware we're getting is has been the same across a lot of different communities but but have been talked about in, in different ways and have been sort of approached slightly differently so mm-hmm. so uh, so we seem to sort of wanted to create a sort of common framework for it mm-hmm. and and essentially the essence of what it's what it's of these principles is they have applications they need to be responsive they need to be responsive both in in the in the face of failure meaning that not 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 just when things go well but when things also start going south and 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 uh, they, then they still need to be able to respond in a timely fashion it, not, it might not always be the response the ideal response right sometimes we, it might we might need to be to be uh, 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 in, you know using some using a graceful degradation not being able to to, to, to fulfill the same quality of service etc but still it can't just stop I mean, I mean, I mean our cust- cu- you, you, so customers and users today they really expect 
a system to always be responsive, and yeah. that's that's also true when I mean uh, when when the system is under heavy load, right? So the so it needs to be responsive, also when 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 uh, when you get slashed out it, you know, or whatever you want to call it, when like Black Friday happens, etc. And 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 the easiest way is of course just to allocate as much hardware as as the peak load time, but that's extremely resource inefficient and very expensive and that's mm-hmm. why we need systems to be elastic also being able to scale down ah. as 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 the system uh, doesn't need these resources any longer and 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 so 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 it's both a bit sort of being able to be responsive of course when things go well but also when things go go bad as well as 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 when things uh, when when you get overloaded etc mm. and 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 we really believe that the best way of doing that is is to build it on a message message oriented core mm. message driven core for various reasons i mean but but um, that's the gist of it essentially right well so this is interesting because the if you look at the reactive manifesto and you're naive like me you see okay there's these qualities responsive resilient elastic message driven but the way that you're explaining it is that these things kind of one follows from the other so first of all you want to be responsive but in order to be responsive even on black friday uh, or from a graceful degradation standpoint you can't just allocate massive amounts of hardware because that's fairly inefficient so the idea of resilient uh, sorry so the idea of elasticity falls out or sorry the idea of resiliency falls out of that and then from that falls uh, ideas of elasticity, and from that falls out ideas of being message-driven. So these four qualities, responsive, resilient, elastic, and message-driven, are the things that ultimately inform that responsiveness and that efficiency that you want to get out of your architecture. Um, would you say that's that's accurate? Yeah, I'd say that. I mean, but, but in in a in a way, is I mean, the the qualities that you want is is an elastic. And resilient system, and the means to get there is through a message passing uh, architecture, essentially. Mm. <laughs> and and there's a reason why why we emphasize message passing and message driven so much. And and the reason is essentially that being message driven means that that you you're, you're sending or you're, you're you're communicating in a fully asynchronous fashion first. And also that you add a network boundary between the, the components, and that is essential in order to achieve full isolation, uh, meaning that components can, I mean, are 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 are, are sort of completely self self contained, mm-hmm. in the in a, in a way that they they can fail in isolation, be restarted in isolation, be upgraded in isolation, but also that they can move around in isolation, so the system can can talk. Can, can start taking advantage of locality of reference, for example, and optimizing the the, the location of, of of components as the system is being used. And that's essential also in order to change the topology of the application as it's being used. You don't want the topology to be fixed into the system. Uh, I mean, because in order to take full advantage of, of, of elasticity, uh, you want that to be able to be changed you know, in a dynamic fashion. And the second reason I'd say is also that that message driven uh, uh, or message driven architecture is is the foundation for what we call location transparency. And this this means that we whenever you call, you're, you're you're communicating with a component. You don't need to care where it's actually residing right now. You compute you communicate it with it as if it is in process but it might it might be in process it might be in process the first time you communicated 10 minutes later it might actually might have moved and 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 you don't need to care about that really uh, since 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 uh, and it's very different from from traditional you know rpc rpc tries to do that by by emulating method did, did method dispatch you know so in process method dispatch so we're trying to fake that there is a network and fake that there is distributed computing going on while being truly message driven is actually the other way around it's like fully embracing that we're building distributed systems mm. 
and and embracing all the constraints of, of the distributed systems you know that uh, meaning things like partial failure that me message ordering message can get you know dropped and, and garbled on the way etc all these things become you know part of the programming model and first class which means that we can deal with them and this also ties back to why it's a better model for dealing with with resilience building a resilient system because the the constraints are there the failure scenarios are there and you need to tackle them head on instead of trying to hide them behind a leaky abstraction, as done in your EJBs, CORBA, you know, XA transactions, RPC, all these are attempts to try to shield the developer from the network, and I think that's wrong. People listening may only have experience dealing with a monolithic system, like a big monolithic Ruby on Rails app or a big monolithic Java EE application. You're describing some things about a distributed architecture that people may not know how to handle. So how do you set up message passing? How do you set up these network bounds? What is the diff between the message passing based microservices infrastructure and the monolithic infrastructure and the just the like big code base that people are used to working with that maybe they if they haven't had an experience setting up a microservices architecture with asynchronous message passing? Yeah, sure. That's a that's a great question. <clears throat> I mean, so you can you can look at it in a little wider sort of lens than just microservices. For example, actor based frameworks. I mean, we that we have, uh, you know, I I've, I've been part of implementing Akka, for example, and 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 that learned a lot from Erlang. That, that that's actor based framework, which is more of a more general di distributed computing fabric. Uh, so so. so so that's so one way of tackling it is to relying on a on a on a distributed systems or fabric or a programming model that understands reactive and is built you know according to the reactive principles like like the actor model for example, but but microservices is, is also uh, I, I believe it's a subset of that and microservices can also help you so leading you into the right architecture if you allow it to. I mean, so you can easily uh, sort of jump on the reactives and uh, sort of on the microservices bandwagon and get it all wrong. And 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 what I and, and one sort of trap that I've that I've seen a lot of people fall into is that when they when they, they have a let let's say they have a monolithic or application that they want to you know slice up into microservices. And then they and and what they do then is that I mean they just take the components in the monolithic app and and instead of having a synchronous dispatch they just turn all these uh, sort of method calls into REST calls still still you often then using synchronous HTTP over REST usually <coughs> and sure I mean you you will get a distributed system and all these things now live in different address spaces and on on different nodes and 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 and, and so on but the problem is that a lot of the problems of the monolith, I mean, are in, you bring along then, uh, because uh, because having synchronous com communi communication as I mean exclusively between microservices means that you will you will have probably not as much but almost as much strong coupling between the components as in the monolith, and that that means that if you know if if one service starts failing. And, and others sort of depend on that you, through synchronous communication. They they will be affected, and this is why a lot of people say, "Yeah, but I just I, I just you know sprinkle circuit breakers all over all over all over all over, all over the place, and now I'm, now and I'm fine. You know, I can sort of sort of, sort of, sort of uh, capture and it's isolate this this. But I think that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Uh, I I believe that that you need to completely fundamentally change the way you think about communication when you break things up into microservices and certain things lend themselves a lot better to messaging not saying everything certain things are naturally inherently syn syn synchronous and then they should be, be be implemented using synchronous http for example or another mechanisms of, of synchronousness but 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 i believe that messaging is a great sort of way uh, to approach things as the default because it gives you all these things that you that you want. It gives you complete loose coupling. It gives you no dependency between them. Gives you full 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 isolation, and 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 it, it really allows you to scale uh, uh, with at, at ease. So you've got a bacon delivery service. 
and you need to notify your customers when their bacon has arrived at their doorstep. Twilio helps you make sure your customers get the bacon while it's hot. Twilio's programmable API lets you build SMS or voice alerts easily in the programming language of your choice, all in under five minutes with only a few lines of code. Now your customers get a text or a call the instant their bacon is ready. If your customers want to see the bacon frying on a hot pan, Twilio has video APIs and SDKs for the platforms that you know and love. Learn more at go.twilio.com slash podcast and get an additional $10 when you sign up and upgrade your account. That's go.twilio.com slash podcast. You will only pay for what you use and it costs less than a penny to send a text. Get started at go.twilio.com slash podcast. Get your bacon delivery service cooking with Twilio's APIs for voice, SMS, and video. So the difference between synchronous and asynchronous message passing would be that synchronous message passing you make a request or you send a message to something and you block until you receive a response. Asynchronous, you make a request and then you continue on doing your work and then at some point in the future you get a call back from the requested service that you made a request to. Is that accurate? Yeah, so uh, yeah, so, sort of. I, I, I usually like to spl- split it up into, into two different things. First, you have, <clears throat> you have synchronous versus asynchronous IO, and that is about you know, sort of not blocking threads. I mean, being sort of resource efficient, right? Uh, 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 but then you also have uh, sort of more conceptually synchronous communication. And, and that is about not blocking requests from other from from other types from, from other ser- services and asynchronous communication allows the the sender and the receiver to not be the be present at the same time mm-hmm. but, but but being syn- being synchronous forces you to have the sender and receiver communicating I- at the same time right so so uh, uh, I usually talk about I mean, about it in that ideally you would like to get to decouple communication into uh, in two different axes. First, in time, uh, uh, and that is essentially what we what we're talking about here. I mean that 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 you you you, you that you don't need this is the, the serve uh, sorry the res- the center and the receiver to be present at the same time. Hmm. But you also but the other axis that you want to 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 uh, is sort of also uh, sort of embraces that you 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 want to to de- to decouple the communication in in time and also in space as well, and 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 that is what gives us distribution. So 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 I think so both of these axes are equally important, I believe, and 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 uh, for 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 true decoupling. Since we're talking about communication, we should touch on the event sourcing. CQRS pattern. We have had a number of shows about this recently. The idea of this pattern is whenever you have an action in an application, you can model that action as an event. You put the event on some sort of pub sub system or a queue, and any subscriber that wants to respond to that event can subscribe to the channel for that event type. And it's a way of decoupling the publishing of the event to the processing of the event from all the downstream services or data sort databases that want to process that event. Why is CQRS useful in a microservices architecture? And what's what's the relationship between the CQRS pattern and this asynchronous message passing that we're talking about? Yeah, that's a good, that's a great question. I think that that. If you have built a system using primarily using me, 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 using messaging, then you already have some messages uh, flying around in the system, and messages can be can be either sort of representing sort of commands, meaning that you want someone to do something. And commands are are are, are side affecting in 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 nature. You will you so you want to like enforce or like try to get someone else to do something right to cause an effect 
Uh, it, they can also be events, as you as you've described. And events are facts. They are, they they uh, sort of are are emitted when something has already happened. Uh, uh, something, and I think commands can be they can be re- rejected, but events can never be taken back. You you can never take back the something a fact that something has already happened. But 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 that said, I mean, when when you have a fully async in a system with messages and events flying around the system, then then event sourcing or command sourcing they are actually two different beasts. Together with CQRS is usually a, a, a very natural way of of doing persistence. Uh, command sourcing, if I should just go into a little bit detail explaining, uh, command sourcing means that you that you store all the commands flowing around in the system. Uh, or actually, commands to a specific component to store that in an in a, in a, in a sort of transaction log, in an event log, or a, or a, or a command log, that so that if the component fails, it can be you can replay this full uh, log, uh, uh, and 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 having you know uh, sort of the all these side affecting operations being being performed on the component, bringing him up to 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 the state he was when he crashed. Another way of, of, of doing it is not to do anything with the commands, but only to store the events, the, so the after the fact that something has changed in the in the in in the in, in the in the component, and, and only re, re, replay that, not the side effects to bring him up to where to where he was. And this is essentially what we talk about with the command and, and event sourcing. CQRS adds yet another layer onto that, in which you separate the right side, or the writing to the event log, from the read side. You know, the, the ultimate way of representing, uh, uh, or shall, actually, or, 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 or persisting an object in a, in, in a message-driven system, as I think, is to use the event log. But the event log is not ideal for 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 things like like, like querying and reading and 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 uh, and, and analyzing sort of this state, and and so that's where CQRS comes in, because in CQRS then you can have also sort of emit the events out to 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 the read side, and have the read side store that in an out in a, like an ultimate format for querying, often the SQL databases or something like Cassandra or something with more rich querying capabilities. Uh, and um, so then you can have the optimal sort of format for writing, the event log, and optimal format for reading, uh, whatever I means SQL databases or something that you would like to use. Are we buffering the, the, the events and the commands on the same platform that we're sending messages between microservices? Uh, you can, but often you use di- different machines, right? And, and this and this means that there there is usually latency between the right side and the read side. Uh, this is why it's extremely important to fully embrace eventual consistency, which I think is 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 not inherent. I mean, uh, just thanks to this way of doing persistence, but the fact that we we that we are doing distributed systems, and and uh, and then you have to. To a large extent, exp- uh, sort of, sort of model your system in a way that eventual consistency is okay. We've been focusing on the message passing component of the reactive microservices architecture. Our architecture is becoming increasingly mobile and transient and ever changing. These nodes die. A service might scale up or down. What are the steps that we need to take to make sure that our services remain addressable as these services are scaling up and down or nodes are dying? I think you mentioned addressability earlier. Yes, yeah, sir. That ties into what, 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 we, what I call, and a lot of people in the reactive systems community call, location transparency. And, and that's essentially by never communicating with a with with component directly, but you have a level of indirection in which, in which you... You communicate with a with with a proxy or 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 or, or with a, with an address or and it, it, it can have many names. In Akka we call them actor ref. In Erlang you call them they, they call them PIDs, process IDs. But but having this level of indirection means that at you you never have to worry that that component is up or not because if. Uh, or actually or even where it resides, right? Because it it might be that you that you start 
that you 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 communicate with the with the object when it's in a failed state when things are not going well and the node might might just have gone down and something like that you as a client communicating with that shouldn't have to care it should be a part of the runtime to restart that reloc relocate it to another machine if necessary etc and if you have this level of interaction and you're only communicating with this with this proxy or, or whatever you want to call it this handle that means that you can buffer messages there, for example, and 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 while this while the the component is being down, the actually the runtime instance of the of the component, and once it's up uh, somewhere else or or where it used to be, you 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 can you can you can sort of flush the buffer. Uh, it also means that if if the if the component is indefinitely down, you can just start you can re redirect these messages to what we call the dead letter queue. And 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 have it have and have it, all these lost messages, so to speak, not being lost, but being able to be mined and be and be and be and, and be logged and 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 uh, have someone no, be notified that you have all these messages that didn't have anywhere to go, etc. So so these these uh, these references should always work, and and are always sort of available until I mean U.S. developer I means sort of permanently shuts it down and notifies all the clients about it uh, or 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 the sysadmin does that through 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 some other mechanism you give a great explanation of the abstract and the the reasons why this is an appealing feature to have this uh, this address this constant addressability this layer of indirection. Can you talk more about the tools that we use to actually implement this and how that infrastructure fits together or how it's configured? In, in ARC, as I said, we have, uh, which, which, uh, which implements the actor model, we have actor refs. And and and, uh, and 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 these are like handles that can be sent around, put in messages. They they are serializable, etc. And and they are completely decoupled from where the actual where the location uh, from where the where the actor is actually running. And Orleans is another actor framework from .NET. And it has the same idea. They call them actor proxy. Uh, and and they actually they go even one step further is in in that if you never communicate I mean if you instantiate an actor but never communicate it then it's actually never even instantiated they only instantiate these actor proxies these handles first and it's only when you start sending messages that the actual runtime instance becomes alive so so which is very interesting for resource e efficiency etc <clears throat> when it comes to microservice design you you can do something similar. Uh, and and it's often sort of backed up by by some by some some sort of service discovery mechanism like like you look up an actor address uh, in the service locator or, or service di di discovery mechanism either either is built into the framework like like it's itself like we do in 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 logon which is our microservices framework or you use something like like uh, like HashiCorp's console or, or some people use Zookeeper or whatever to look it up. The problem there, if I mean, is that you then you then you if you don't have you know this this uh, this um, handles like a physical representation of that means that you need to look look up the address per periodically or or every time you call you you call out to make sure that you always have the right one because it's not maintained automatically for you. Microservices themselves are are easy to reason about from a boxes and arrows. Uh, drawings standpoints to some loosely coupled services that are communicating with each other where it actually gets difficult and you write about this in your book is that there's these things around them like discovery and coordination security replication within a single service it's really easy to reason about the consistency guarantees but the same is not true for the overall system especially when we have these features that I just mentioned this discovery coordination and so on how should we reason about the consistency guarantees of the overall system? Because this seems a lot more complex than the consistency guarantees of a single service. Absolutely, I think. I mean, when you, you're absolutely right. I mean that that building one single microservice that a lot of sort of a lot of microservices frameworks they focus on, they do, making it easy to scaffolding for 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 a single service. It actually doesn't buy us that much. So of course, I mean, it, it, there is. It's important to get each individual microservice right, but but microservices they come in systems always, and it's and it's always 
in the space between, in this void between the miser components or, or, or the distributed components that all the bad things happen. But it's also where all the good things can happen, you know, where you can get scale and resilience and all these things. But, they, but that's, <clears throat> but it's in the space between that's all the hard things that are. So that that's where I think that, that we need to put some more focus on that and not not just talking about how easy it is to 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 create single market services and 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 the hardest thing as you already mentioned there is what do you do with state i mean how do you make sure that <clears throat> that that your services are consistent uh, have a, have a sort of stable view on things that they have they need to have agreement upon uh, I, I i think that the first rule is to try to minimize communication between microservices as much as possible, ideally to min to bare minimum, uh, uh, because communication means 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 some sort of coordination of of state. You publish facts that others need to care need to care about, etc., and 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 and, and, and all kind of communication is is costly, but coordination of state is 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 what is where where is where it really slows slows down. Mm. You know, you know, people talk about. Uh, I mean, sort of locks and then in in, in in is is bad for for concurrent programming, right? Because locks make sure that you uh, sort of sort of forces you to wait. That one thread needs to wait on the resource for uh, that 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 some other component is currently using. I mean, in this it becomes even more important in distributed systems design. That I mean, waiting in a cluster is extremely costly. And 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 if if you introduce sort of mutable state or or, or dependency on state that you just, that multiple microservices they need to sort of agree upon, then you essentially introduce locking and 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 and, uh, and sort of transactions, so to speak, across the cluster, which is extremely costly. So 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 I always think 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 about it like or try to tell people that. You should start with the data, really, when you when you when you when you design microservices, when you split up into microservices, and 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 try to 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 come up with a sort of with a minimal data set that needs to be sort of strongly cons consistent, that needs to be fully transactional, atomic, so so to, so to speak, and and often that that sort of data set or data sets. Depending on different use cases, of course, is actually a lot smaller than people think. People are used to think like everything should always be fully consistent because we're spoiled by SQL databases, mm -hmm. right? But if if, it, if you take a step step back and look, how do we solve? How how should this be solved in the real world? What are the real constraints? And 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 then and then try to minimize the the consistency boundary essentially that needs to be strongly consistent. And then you often using the denormalization, of course, and so splitting things up, and 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 there and there you often have your your microservice. And if if you think about it like that, then 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 you decouple the microservices from a data dependency standpoint as much as possible, <clears throat> which which means that they don't need to coordinate state between themselves as much, which is which is which is very very important. Can you give an example to make this more tangible for the listeners? So you, you're talking about this idea where if you have services that are dependent upon each other and you're trying to make some sort of stateful thing happen, you get blocking and you get wasted CPU cycles. Can you give an example for how this might happen and a bad way to architect it and a good way to architect it? Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't know if I come up come up with a with a super good with a good practical example, but but whenever whenever you request you know something from someone and are dependent on him doing an update on that on on that thing and then returning it to you, uh, uh, I mean, then you're sort of then you're then you're forced into synchronous communication. And then you have to wait for that thing that you're that, that so that processing to be done uh, in a fully consistent fashion over there, and send that over to you to have to have to uh, and even that that makes it I mean, it, it makes it even more more it even makes it even harder you know when 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 that sort of spans multiple ser 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 services when you need to do an update in one of your of your microservice return that result and sort of atomically 
propagate that to yet another microservice. All essentially, I mean, all in sort of one one transaction, so to speak. Uh, uh, then all these three need to be doing this in lockstep, and and uh, and often can't do anything else in between. Uh, or actually, or while this this sort of transaction is is happening, uh, uh, the the ideal way would be would be to to instead of instead trying to embrace sort of uh, more a more eventual consistency way of of thinking with pu publishing facts and having refer, re, re, sort of what I call compensating trans, tra transactions that you you sort of take a bet that something will happen. And and or 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 that that the data that 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 you got or I mean sort of the uh, so will hold and 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 then you do then you perform your action with that expectation and if you if you if and if you were wrong then you then 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 you perform a compensating sort of action reversing your work and try again perhaps for etc. Your company runs on Apple devices. Developers use Apple laptops, project managers use iPads, and everyone uses an iPhone. Jamf Now is a cloud-based mobile device management solution for iPads, iPhones, and Macs in your workplace. Jamf Now makes device management accessible and affordable for everyone, so businesses can support their users without help from the IT department. With Jamf Now, you can configure settings on all of your Apple devices quickly and consistently over the air, and Jamf Now allows you to manage your devices by centrally deploying apps anytime from anywhere. You can create a free account today at jamf.com slash sedaily. That's J-A-M-F dot com forward slash sedaily. Use Jamf now to ensure that the sensitive company information that your employees access on their Apple devices remains secure. Enforce passcodes and encryption over the air. Even remotely lock or wipe a device. See how easy it is to set up, manage, and secure your Apple devices anytime from anywhere. Manage your first three devices for free, and you can add more for just $2 per device per month. Create your free account today at jamf.com slash sedaily. That's J-A-M-F dot com slash sedaily. Well, you're talking here about graceful degradation. Maybe we could talk about cir the circuit breaker pattern here. The circuit breaker is often used to gracefully degrade if you have one of these request chains where you need service A to request data from service B and service B to request data from service C and so on. If there's a failure somewhere in that request chain, you don't want to just have complete catastrophic failure. You want to have some kind of graceful degradation. Could you talk more about how the circuit breaker pattern works and how to use it effectively to manage request chains? Yeah, so the the this the, the circuit breaker pattern is has been around for quite some time. I, I read it first, I think, in in, in Michael Nygaard's book uh, on uh, on uh, yeah, I release it. Yeah, stability patterns and stuff like that. Exactly, and and it's 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 essentially a, a, a state machine where you where you can have. I mean, if if everything goes well, the default is that is in that is in in a closed state, meaning that is sort of. That is sort of uh, it passes through everything, uh, all the all the requests. I mean, as you would expect, right? But if if something goes wrong, then it goes then it sort of trips and it goes to its open state. That means that it doesn't allow any request to go to go to go through. And there there's usually a sort of some sort of timeout that says like within ten seconds it might be okay to retry, and then it then and then it passes it lets one transaction through. Or one request through, and if it if it fails again, then it goes immediately back to open. But, but then usually some sort some sort of exponential back off policy. This is then it waits perhaps twenty seconds, and then one minute and whatever it is, right? But and and uh, and if it succeeds, then it usually goes sort of uh, 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 goes back to closed, right? And and, and uh, so 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 you have this sort of well defined. Uh, Sort of 
state machine with well-defined stages and and where you where you where you try to 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 go to um, to sort of essentially test if the service that you, that failed is is up again, and if it's not, then you then you then you sort of go back to 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 usually to some sort of, of fallback policy. The fallback policy can of course be to just drop messages on the floor. It can be to 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 send them off to some other component that that hopefully is up. Or it can be to also propagate them back to the one who sent the message and, and, and saying, I mean, the, the service is up. You need to do something about that. I don't know how. And, uh, and it can also be, you know, falling back to a, a, a less, uh, less nice, but some, but, but sort of lower quality of service, essentially. That that's often how Netflix is doing it. <clears throat> Uh, in 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 that I mean if 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 part of the catalog is not, is currently not available then it it, it then it it shows you what it what it what it can and 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 try to like limp along as long as possible un- until full functionality is restored. Let's zoom in on another particular facet of a microservice architecture, which is service discovery. This allows microservices to locate and communicate with each other. What are some of the tools that developers can use for handling service discovery, and how do you recommend companies handle service discovery? As I said, I mean, most of these things, most of these uh, things we have talked about, like circuit breakers and service discovery, are already are sort of sort of solved problems. There are already a whole bunch of good tools, perhaps too many tools in, in certain areas that solves these things for you. So it's nothing that you as a developer need to start doing yourself, I believe. <laughs> uh, service discovery can be done in, in different ways and, and implemented using using different sort of guarantees. There are certain service discovery tools that, for example, like like like, like Zookeeper, which is not really a service dis- discovery tool, but a lot of people use it like that, or, or that are sort of are implemented in a, in a in a sort of in in a strongly consistent fashion. They and that means that according to, to the cap theorem, they failure they f- sort of favor uh, consistency over avail- availability. Uh, and 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 uh, personally, I I even even though that's almost the common way of doing it, I think I I don't. Think that's the optimal way of, of, of implementing service discovery. You know, so, you know. So the, the the problem of service discovery is that you know, you have nodes coming up and down, and 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 and, and sort of spawning up a node and taking the node down, and also like migrating nodes, etc. All that has quite long latency. So 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 if 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 it has latency and, and quite a lot of delay to 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 do or to perform all these actions with nodes, I mean I, I there's less reason to having the sort of the ad, so the naming is the dictionary so to speak to look things up strongly co- co- consistent because it might still be that 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 that. That uh, whatever I mean, this address is pointing to, to is not is not yet up, or it actually just went down, or it's just being migrated, or whatever. So so since there's already sort of uh, a built-in eventual consistency into the into the model of service discovery, I think it's better to rely on 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 sort of an of an on the AP side the availability side of the cap theorem instead and there are there are certain uh, sort of uh, uh, tools that favor that favor that uh, uh, for example the one we have in logom uh, favors that is using com- C- crdts i mean commute com- 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 or conflict free uh, re- conflict free replicated data types to propagate out to you know, this this the changes in 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 these addresses and uh, Sort of in a fully eventually consistent fashion, in a way that will eventually con- con- converge with with some delay. Uh, other tools that, that favor availability are is Netflix Eureka, for example, and etc. And um, so yeah, so so there's so two two different flavors of it, and I, I I usually tend to personally lean towards the availability side, sacrificing consistency when it comes to this. And I think from my shows with 
Netflix and Uber, those two companies definitely agree with you on the availability over consistency model. Um, <clears throat> so you work at Lightbend, and Lightbend is very interested in microservices right now because you are building this Lagom framework, or you you have built it already. What is the Lagom framework? What are you doing at Lightbend? Yeah, so that's two two different questions. I mean, I can I can I can start by 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 trying to explain what we do at large, and then zoom in on the Logon framework. So so at large, we we I mean, we we have a platform uh, called Aka for building reactive reactive systems, and we've had it since since actually even before we started Lightbend. I mean, I had a company that that had a consultancy around uh, the Aka. Aka. The Aka platform started already eight years ago. Actually, Lightband is about six six years old now, and and uh, at the absolute bottom, even below Aka, is it's the Scala programming language that we that we that we've had, or that we we are the main the, the main contributor and the main main and maintainer of. So Aka is implemented in Scala. But it's not uh, it's not exclusive to Scala. We we've always had had equal Java APIs. Alongside the Scala APIs, even though we we implement uh, our our platform in Scala, and then we also have had the Play framework, which is which is sort of like high a high a high productivity framework for building web apps, uh, even server side templating, like the Ruby on Rails sort of sort of, sort of, uh, sort of development console with like really fast turnaround times, etc. So, so that is sort of the basics. Then, then we have uh, the last year or so we've been we've been focusing on on two different things that we built on top of this platform, and that and one of them is mic- is microservices, and the other one is fast data so slash streaming, uh, uh, distributed streaming type of applications, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> um, when it comes to streaming, we we uh, we have sort of a, a we have had a sort of a product or or the sort of or an offering based around Spark, but we're now working on a product called the Fast Data Platform that 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 goes way beyond Spark, uh, more into the real time so d- d- distributed streaming uh, world. Uh, uh, it's 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 we have an alpha coming out next week actually or in around this, but uh, but more specifically you asked about the microservices and logom. So so. What we have done there is essentially, sort of, you know, taking a step back. People have built microservices type of architectures using Akka and Play for for quite a few years. Actually, even before we start, I, I heard the the, the term microservice because it, because microservices lend themselves very well to to the way you think about when you're building actor based systems. I mean, they map very well, almost one to one, with the same you know type of of of, of semantics and and and, and ideas. But that said, <clears throat> actors are a fairly low-level di- distributed computing fabric and and programming model that can be sometimes give the user too much power. It's too much you you can do. It's it's too powerful essentially. Uh, it means that there's too many ways you can shoot sh- you can shoot your, your, yourself in the foot. For power users, that's all. This power is great. For but for a lot of people, it slows them down. There's a lot of things to learn. And and there's uh, uh, there's too many ways you can you you can do something. So to fix that, we essentially took all the best practices of building microservices using using actors and, and play, uh, and and sort of wrap that up in a framework that's extremely opinionated, and 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 have sort of very like very clear like beaten path how you should do things. And that's the logom framework, and and and. Uh, where logom is opinionated is essentially in, in sort of three different ways. I mean, first, sort of commu- com- it's, it's asynchronous by default, meaning asynchronous I/O all the way, as well as as, as asynchronous communication as the default. This, of course, supports REST uh, synchronous HTTP for the for the use cases where you need to be synchronous. But everything, if you if you if if you just go with the default, uh, messaging is the way we to sort of. Uh, rec- recommend the other way is that is is actually using event sourcing and CQRS as the default persistence mechanism. This is also quite different from a lot of a lot of microservices frameworks out there that are more CRUD based. Um, some of them even use like JPA and these type of things. 
still, even though, even though it's more, it's more, it's more, it's more legacy. So it got, it goes all all in on 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 an event based persistence model. And the third thing is that is sort of it, it 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 has learned from from all the goodies that we that we learned from play when it comes to to the effectiveness. Of, of, or the importance of of a, of a of a high productive development environment. So so it has sort of this almost Ruby on Rails type of feel, you know, where you can or the J Rebel type of feel, but across microservices. So 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 you can sp- you can spin up all your microservices right in, in your development environment, and if you if if you do one code change in your IDE, the, so this development console will understand that it will re reboot. It will recompile, of course. It will redeploy and reboot your microservice alongside all the d- dependencies that that re- sort of, uh, that it depends on, just automatically, right? So you can just work in your IDE, and 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 uh, and all er- all these nice things sort of are redeployed and restarted under the hood for you. The the Legom framework seems like it's built for well, at least one use case is to get people who are in a Java EE monolith uh, architecture a, to give them an, a route to migrating towards microservices. Um, could you, uh, as we wrap up, can you talk a little bit about how, what what is that migration path? Because I imagine that is very difficult if you've got this huge Java monolith and and then you're presented with, a, with this um, comprehensive framework that uh, allows you to move to microservices. What is that? migration path you're right you're, you're you're right i mean the ideal scenario is of course if you have greenfield development i mean you can you, you can just go all in and do everything from from start but a lot of a lot of companies don't have that that luxury and they <coughs> they want to modernize their existing uh, applications and often monoliths and then often you know je based uh, uh, meaning ser- servlet based uh, and 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 uh, often jpa and, and 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 stuff like that so the first i mean i think that the best way to do it is to use sort of the what i call the strangler pattern that you sort of you, you try to like vertically slice up use cases into microservices and 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 sort of around your monolith, right? One by one by one, like in the sort of strangle the monolith until there's there's no monolith left, and there is is only micro microservices. <laughs> and and for each individual microservice, I mean, so one of the benefits of it of, of microservices, you know, is that you can you can fully embrace polyglot persistence, and 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 that each microservice can represent this data in any way it wants. This means that you, you can actually choose to not go all in with event sourcing and CQRS as the first step, but you but you 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 continue to use JPA or JDBC uh, for for certain microservices until you feel that you are ready to 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 go all in on something like event sourcing if it fits right for certain applications i mean crud I mean, for, for certain microservices I mean, crud based might be the way to just go but for others you can you can uh, you can do it gradually you know and 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 logom has jpa and jdbc support as well right so, so you, you can start with by not being completely opinionated uh, and 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 take uh, you know sort of tackle the complexities one by one. The first one might be to, to 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 uh, the the first one might actually be to just do everything with the rest and see okay where where are the uh, uh, sort of what are the problems with this? I mean where I mean where where does it impact scalability? Where where does it mainly impact resilience etc. And in these places only move to a messaging based made based solution between microservices and 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 the same thing i mean with 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 persistence i mean continue using jbc and J- jpa as a start and then slowly moving towards more event based event logging type of persistence if you feel like you need to uh, uh, so yeah, i think you can be pragmatic and, and not being only religious about it even though logum tries to be opinionated all the way through well, I don't want to take any more of your time. Jonas, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, I'm going to have your colleague Marcus Eisel on soon to talk about developing reactive microservices. I feel like today we talked about a lot of the 
concepts that make reactive microservices appealing. And I'm looking forward to my conversation with Marcus about how to bring these into reality. Um, I think there there was also a show. Yeah, yeah. And there was also a show a while ago I did with um, another Lightbend employee. His name is escaping me right now, but it was about reactive streams. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you folks well, so Conrad from, or- from Lightbend. Yes, Conrad. Conrad Malowski. But yeah, you you all have a very rigorous and technical approach to developing products, so it's always a pleasure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's 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 interesting that you say that because I mean, logo. I mean, a lot of the things we we have talked about here is 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 uh, is actually implement is implemented using using Aka streams and reactive streams, as I'm as I'm sure he talked he talked about in that in that session as well. So I mean, you you, you give uh, give Marcus my regards then and have fun chatting. Absolutely. With him. Okay. Well, thanks, Jonas. I'll talk to you soon. Software Engineering Daily is having our first ever meetup in San Francisco, January 11th at Galvanize. If you live in the Bay Area and you listen to Software Engineering Daily, please come check it out. I would love to meet you. We're going to have some awesome speakers. We have Pete Hunt, who is one of the early members of the React.js team, who is now the CEO of Smite. Hasib Qureshi, who has been one of the most popular guests on Software Engineering Daily. Preeti Kasireddy, who has written about her career transition from venture capital to software engineering via coding bootcamp. Each one of these speakers is going to give an awesome talk, and I hope you can make it January 11th at Galvanize in San Francisco. You can sign up on meetup.com. You can also find the link on the Software Engineering Daily website, softwareengineeringdaily.com. I really hope to see you there. Thank you.